Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon taking your calls if you have questions you'd like to ask on the air about the Bible or the Christian faith or if you have a different viewpoint than the host on any subject in inviting people to call with any question. I'm not implying that I know the answer to every question, but uh, I've been teaching the Bible as a profession and not really a profession because I think you get paid if, if you're a professional, but let's just say as a calling, I've been uh, a full-time Bible teacher for 49 years now, almost 50. And in that time, I've taught through every book of the Bible multiple times, and I've encountered all the questions probably that people have in all likelihood. Now, you might be able to come up with something I've never heard, but not likely. It doesn't happen very often. So uh, I have at least had a chance to give thought to almost every question. So I can talk about them with you, and maybe we even have answers for you. Right now the lines are full, but you can take this number down, and if you call in a few minutes, you'll probably find a line has opened up. The number is 844-484-5737. All right, let's talk to, first of all, uh, let's see, looks like it's Dennis from San Mateo, California. Dennis, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. I was wondering if you could uh, unpick. Hey, you're very quiet. Are you, uh, are you talking right into your phone? Because you sound like you're very far away. Uh, is it better? No, it's not better. It's v- very faint. Jeez, I'm talking. Wow, I'm talking right into my phone. I don't know. I can hardly I'll hear you. Maybe the call studio back can turn you can't hear me. Yeah, I, it sounds like you're a thousand miles away from my headphones. I don't know how it is. With yours. Okay, oh okay, go goodness. ahead. I think I know what was wrong. I had a dial turned down. Go ahead. I'm sure it was my fault. Well, I, all I want you to do, and I'm happy to take the off the air, if you could unpack what the wrath to come is from 1 Thessalonians 10. Mm-hmm. 1 Thessalonians 1 10, where it says that God saved us, Jesus saved us from the wrath to come. Well, yeah, exactly. of course, yeah. The wrath to come, in this case, I think, must be the final judgment, the final judgment. Now, sometimes wrath in certain contexts refers to some temporal wrath, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sometimes it's talking about God's wrath coming against some nation or other in some temporal judgment. And many times in the New Testament, it's talking about the wrath of God coming on Jerusalem, which was going to happen within a generation of the time that Jesus spoke. Now, the reason I say that I don't see it that way this, this, in this case is because the Bible definitely does indicate that there is a day of judgment at the end, which will be a time of wrath also. And um, I don't see how the Thessalonians would be affected by the wrath that was coming on Jerusalem. The, uh, the invasion of the Romans in Israel was certainly a bloodbath and a holocaust for the Jews in Israel. And maybe even for Jews elsewhere, there might have been some repercussions taken against them. But the Thessalonians were almost entirely made up of uh, Gentile believers, and and they were very far geographically from Israel. So they would not have been particularly in the line of fire as far as the judgment coming on Israel. Um, So I I don't think Paul would say to the people who lived in Thessalonica, which was Greece, Uh, You know, when you came to Christ, he saved you from the wrath that's coming on Jerusalem because that wouldn't be relevant to them, I think. Not relevant in the same way it would be to the people who live there. I mean, it's it's a relevant historical fact to all Christians, but you and I have not been saved from the wrath that came upon the people of Jerusalem, neither were the Thessalonians. So I think it must be a more general uh, wrath. Now, of course, wrath, uh, wrath to come, as I said, can be temporal or eschatological. But because of the particular audience of this of this epistle, I think it would be more eschatological because I don't think the local wrath would uh, relate to them. Huh. Okay, thanks, Steve. All right, thanks for your call, Dennis. All right, Fred from Seattle, Washington. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call. And thanks for sharing with us you being um, almost on the air or studying actually the Bible for almost 50 years. That's amazing. Yeah, I've actually been teaching. I've been teaching as uh, as my calling for 50, almost 50 years. I've been studying longer than that. But uh, wow. 
but I have only been on the air for, what, 22 years, I think, with this program. Well, it's amazing, and it's a blessing to hear you. So, Thank uh, you. Thanks, thanks to God. So all I'm calling regards is to the misquoted phrase of spare the rod and, and spoil the child. Mm -hmm. um, I was researching in brief the two things I was uh, curious about is in Proverbs 13:24 and Proverbs 23, uh, 13 through 14 regarding, you know, uh, withhold not correction from the child for thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Right. Thou shall right. not him. But anyway, I was just curious what your interpretation is for this. About Especially when I have uh, kids. Okay. Well, uh, I believe what's being said here is that we need to, with our children, avoid the problems that, for example, Eli had or David had with their children. Uh, it says about Eli in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Samuel that his sons made themselves vile and Eli did not restrain them. And this brought judgment on the house of Eli and caused them to be rejected from the priesthood. Uh, in David's case, he was pretty indulgent with his sons and one of them in particular Adonijah it's in first kings I think it's chapter one verse six or so it says that David had never displeased his son Adonijah and never even challenged him on anything he did much less discipline him well that son got himself killed by making an illegitimate grab for the throne and so you know he was kind of a arrogant and uh, undisciplined child now, the Bible gives many examples of such things, and we see many of them around us where children have been left to either be raised by themselves or by bad examples, often other children, their peers, and they don't turn out well. So the Bible indicates that people are born inclined to do their own thing, inclined to do things that aren't necessarily right, that is sinful. And, uh, and this is an inclination that needs to be corrected out of them. It says in Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod will drive it from him. And so it indicates that children are born foolish and they're not always, they don't always learn just from being told what's wise. They sometimes, their foolishness manifests in bad behavior and has to be disciplined out of them. Now we live in a time where corporal punishment has fallen on hard times, uh, you know, in, in the Western civilization, it's probably illegal to spank your child in most of Europe and in some of the states of the United States too, which is really a shame because we're really, we've got a generation that's come up under those policies that are in many cases very badly disciplined and there's far more crime, far more, uh, you know, aimlessness, far, far more children who grow up and aren't mature anymore. Uh, they've not been made to become adults or take responsibility because their parents have not trained them. And training does involve at the very least, displeasing them, because the, the point of discipline is to teach a child to associate uh, unpleasant consequences with certain types of wrong actions. And so when they do these wrong actions, it's the parent's responsibility to administer the unpleasantness. Now, in biblical times, the unpleasantness is described as a, <clears throat> as a spanking or with a, a rod on the butt or whatever. There can be other forms of discipline, and unfortunately, uh, our society has lost touch with reality enough to not realize that uh, a spanking is actually a very effective and and positive form of discipline. But uh, if they if it's not if you're not allowed to spank them, you're gonna to have to do it either secretly or else find some other way to get them to associate uh, unpleasantness with their bad actions. Because if parents don't find some way to make the children smart for their bad behavior, uh, the children will simply be uh, encouraged in that bad behavior. Uh, in, in in Proverbs, or excuse me, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is actually talking about God's uh, delaying of consequences for human bad behavior. And he says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Now, this is not about children, but, but humans in general. That if, if, you know, because God doesn't immediately punish for bad behavior, people feel they're getting away with it and they become established in it. Uh, you can't really do much to adults except, I mean, the criminal justice system can, but uh, uh, one adult can't really do much to another adult to correct his behavior except with a word. But with children, parents have the obligation to apply force if necessary. That's why God made children smaller than adults so that adults could, you know, uh, enforce good behavior 
on children and, and teach the children good behavior. Now, there are plenty of people who, when they think about spanking, they think of abuse. They think of beatings. They, they might even, e either in their imagination or in their real experience, have uh, know something about uh, abusive parents who are just angry and furious and abusive and have hurt their children. Uh, it's a shame that this thought comes to mind when people read these verses, because most people of my generation and older don't think of spanking as abuse. I was spanked when I was a child, not very often. I guess I didn't need it very often. I probably needed it more often than I got it, but I did get spanked a few times. It never occurred to me at the time nor now that that was abusive, but it did teach me to fear a uh, violation of my parents' rules and standards, and that's a good thing. That's what children need to learn. And I would say that we've raised many good generations of people on the spankings of their parents, because their parents spanking them. And most people, you know, some fools today who think that spanking is wrong have said, well, if you, if you show violence to a child, you'll just teach the child that violence is all right. No, that's not what you teach the child. I mean, that's some psychologist may have come up with that theory, but it's just not true to fact. If you judiciously spank your child, you're not teaching the child that violence is okay. You're teaching the child that there are consequences for bad behavior, unpleasant ones. And if you only spank a child when he deserves it, then you'll make it very clear that uh, that, that violence only would uh, be useful and appropriate when it's really deserved. It's not going to be teaching them to be violent people, going out hurting innocent people, because they were not hurt as innocent people. The parents enforced an idea of justice, an idea of just consequences. That's something that children do not learn naturally without their parents uh, getting involved or somebody. Sometimes it's not the parents. Kids are sometimes raised by their grandparents or some other surrogate, but if whoever is raising them does not enforce on them the fact that there's good behavior and bad behavior, and bad behavior has consequences that are painful, uh, then that child's not gonna be, not gonna do well as an adult. You know, if you don't teach your child if you don't control your child when they're little, uh, then the state will have to control them, and, and they do that with prisons and other penalties. Uh, much better to love your child by teaching them good behavior before they're out of your control, before they're out there where it's up to the state to keep them under control, because the state won't put up with any guff. It's interesting that the state will make laws against parents controlling their children, and even against parents punishing their children, but the state doesn't make laws against itself punishing criminals, which is a very inconsistent thing. But those are my thoughts on that passage. Most excellent. I really appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Fred. Good talking to you. Uh, let's talk to uh, Philip from Brentwood, California. Philip, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I've uh, got a couple of questions about Hebrews 12, I guess verse 15 or something. When Israel gave up his birthright in the, in the book of Hebrews, it calls him a, a profane, a wicked man, because it's his translated by some uh, teachers as he gave up his, his possibility for eternal life when he gave up his birthright. Uh, That's nonsense. That translation correct? No, it's, it's nonsense. To give up his birthright was not to give up his salvation. A birthright is simply the... Uh, a description of the earthly privileges associated with being the firstborn son in a family. God never did have it as a condition of salvation that someone had to be the firstborn of their family. Uh, that'd be ridiculous. I mean, firstborn of the family had certain social privileges within the family. Uh, they took over for the father as the head of the family when the father was gone. Uh, they received twice the physical inheritance, uh, twice as much as the other children, and so forth. So these, the birthright had to do with physical things. Now, in this case, uh, between Esau and Jacob, the question was which of them was going to become the ancestor of the Messiah because their father, Jacob, had been promised that the seed that would come from him would, would be the Messiah, would be the one who brings blessing to all nations. A similar promise had been made to his grandfather and his, uh, that is his father and his grandfather. Abraham and Isaac. So this, this was a special family in which God had promised that someday down the line there's going to be a seed or an offspring who would bless all the nations. And the New Testament tells us that's Jesus. Now, this is what Esau lost. He lost the right to have the earthly status in his family 
of being the one through whom the important promises made to his ancestors would be fulfilled. That is, Jesus did not come through Esau's descendants, but from uh, Jacob's descendants. Uh, so this is the this is the import of his loss of birthright. Now, a matter of, when it comes to salvation, there's no discussion in the Bible of Esau's salvation or Jacob's. Every time they are mentioned together in the New Testament, it is to say that uh, you know Esau lost his privilege that he was born with as the older son, uh, and and that's you know that's not the same thing as losing your salvation. Uh, you know the you you can lose out every, on everything on earth and still be saved if your heart is the Lord's. Now we don't know very much about Esau's heart after this particular incident. Yes, it does say he was a profane person and sold his birthright. That was pretty early in his life compared to how long he lived. Uh, we do see even 20 years after that time that he met with Jacob and seemed to be on good terms with Jacob. And, and later they, they buried their father together. And there's every evidence that Esau had a, a more positive disposition in his later life. So whether he died in faith or not, we don't know. The Bible doesn't follow his life like it does Jacob's because the Bible is interested in following only one family line. But... Uh, Esau, for all we know, because we know very little about his later life, may have been a man of faith who died in faith. But what Hebrews 12 is warning us about is not to make choices like those that Esau made. And the point in, in, in this case is not about salvation, but about making carnal choices, which you cannot undo. He said that he, you know, he made this choice to sell his birthright, and later he wanted to get the blessing. But he couldn't get it because he he couldn't undo what was done. He could, he could find no place of repentance. That doesn't mean he couldn't repent. It means he couldn't get his father to change his mind. Repentance means change the mind. You might remember after Esau sold his birthright, it was later in his life he tried to have the blessing, but it wasn't his because he'd sold his birthright and it belonged to, the blessing belonged to Jacob. And although Esau wished to change that, even with tears, he tried to persuade his father to change that. His father couldn't change it, wouldn't change it. So this is, he couldn't find any place of repentance. Doesn't mean that he wasn't able to repent. It's saying he couldn't, he could not persuade his father, the one who's making the decision about giving the blessings, his father, Jake, his father, Isaac, he couldn't persuade him to repent or to change his mind about this. So there's nothing really said in that passage about Esau's spiritual life, except that he made a very foolish carnal choice to satisfy himself with one meal at the expense of a very long term loss to him. But that long-term loss is nowhere indicated to be eternal. Uh, certainly the Old Testament never describes, nor does the New Testament, the salvation or loss condition of Esau or Jacob. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, Philip. Thanks for your call. Okay, let's talk to uh, David from Portland, Oregon. David, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Oh, you're welcome. I wanted to ask a question about uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay. And I was uh, studying, and I asked you this before, but I can't remember what you said. But anyway, um, you know, there was a guy way back in the early church that was excommunicated for saying that Jesus wasn't the mother of God. He was the mother of Jesus. You mean Mary was not the mother and, of God? That, that was Nestorius. Yeah. Hmm? Mm -hmm. That was Nestorius. Pardon? That was Nestorius oh. who made that, and, it, and he was saying that Mary Nestorius. was not the mother. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, he was anyway, not the mother. She was not anyway, the mother of God. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, there's all this stuff about Mary and and uh, in the Catholic Church, and and they believe that Mary never had any sex, and she had all of her children without sex, and things like that, and. Well, no, they, they uh, where say did that, all this where did all this stuff get started? Okay, well, I don't know who started it, but yeah, yeah, the Bible, the Bible indicates that Mary had other other family besides Jesus, other children. There's Jesus had four brothers and some sisters. Now, uh, it doesn't specifically say these these other children were the sons of and daughters of Mary. They're simply said to be the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Now. Some have thought maybe Joseph had some kids from a previous marriage when he married Mary, and therefore they were like half-brothers and sisters of Jesus. But there's no reason to suggest this unless someone has already decided that they don't want Mary to have any other children, just Jesus. 
and that is the position that the that some of the early uh, well I should say later church fathers took about Mary that she uh, never did have a relations with her husband that she just had Jesus uh, virginally and then she remained a virgin and uh, you know Joseph just had to take a lot of uh, cold showers I guess so so she, she and her husband never had a sexual relationship but you know the Bible doesn't really indicate that in fact it sounds like it indicates that they did because it says about Mary in the last verse of Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph did not know her that is didn't have sex with her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus now the word firstborn would suggest there were other sons but the word firstborn is not in all of the manuscripts so the Alexandrian manuscripts do not have the word firstborn just have she brought forth her son but it does say that Joseph didn't know her that is have sex with her until she had brought forth her son Jesus which normally would mean that was that was the end of abstinence at that point uh, they they had normal relations afterwards now the word until doesn't have to mean that things changed in their sexual relationship after Jesus was born but its most natural meaning in the absence of other information would generally be taken that way now the fact that people referred to Jesus brothers and sisters without any indication that they were not Mary's children just gives the default idea that Mary and Joseph did have other children after Jesus was born. If they did not, that's fine. I mean, a Protestant doesn't care, uh, but Catholics care a great deal that they want Mary to have never had any other children, never uh, have uh, you know, uh, lost her virginity. But why? Uh, this is because in the early days of the church, uh, because of a certain ascetic kind of streak in some of the church fathers, it began to be felt that being a virgin was better than being married. Being a virgin was better than having regular sexual uh, relations and having children. Now, therefore, there was a group of people called virgins who were, in fact, people sworn to virginity who were in the church. And they were kind of, over the years, they got higher and higher esteem in the eyes of their fellow Christians for being virgins, permanent celibates. And it's in the atmosphere of this this high esteem for virgins that the church began to teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin too. After all, she's got to be the best of all women. And if the best thing you can do is be a virgin, then she must have been a virgin and never lost that. This is comes from an attitude that's not biblical at all. Uh, I've, I've read Catholics saying, you know, the mother of, who, who bore the Messiah, uh, you know, she could not be defiled with, uh, you know, having sex with a man. Well, this this Catholic idea is a very low view of marriage, a very low, much lower than the Bible's view of marriage. When God made Adam and Eve, he commanded them to be sexually reproductive, to be fruitful and multiply. And it says in Hebrews uh, chapter, chapter 12, or I guess it's 13, that marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled. So a, a married couple who are sleeping together are not defiling themselves. There's nothing defiling about uh, sex within marriage, within legitimate marriage. And uh, that, of course, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the actual verse here. It's, uh, it's in uh, Hebrews chapter, uh, well, I thought it was right at the beginning of chapter 13, but I'm not going to take time to look for it right now. Anyway, the point is that the scripture specifically says that the bed is undefiled. And, oh, it's it's uh, Hebrews 13:4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled. So if Mary and Joseph were married, as the Bible says they were, and they had a sexual relationship, as would normally be the case, uh, that was not defiling. It didn't defile her. And if there was something so unusual about their marriage, namely that they were had a, a sexless marriage, that's so unusual you'd think the Bible might mention it, as if that was maybe important. If it wasn't important, why would they do it? That is, if it was wrong for Mary to have sex, why would they even be married? Why would uh, God have her get married to a man? And why wouldn't it mention that this was a, a unique marriage where, though normally men and women who are married to each other have relations and bear children, uh, you know, this one's different. Well, the Bible doesn't say it's different, so there's no reason to believe it is. 
And this whole idea that Mary must have been a virgin, I believe, comes just about entirely from an attitude in the early church, as I said, an attitude that it's somehow not right for people to have sex, or it's better to be a virgin. That's not something the Bible teaches, and therefore it's not something that I would support. All right? Thank you. All right, I appreciate your call. Okay, we're going to take a break here at the just at the bottom of the hour and come back. We have another half hour ahead, so don't go away. We've got many calls waiting. We have one line open. If you would like to call, the number is 844-484-5737. Now, I'm going to be in Kansas City teaching next week. All the mornings are taken and a couple of the nights, but I have a few nights open. If you're listening in Kansas City and want to host a meeting, get in touch with me right away. If you don't want to host a meeting but you'd like to attend one, I'm going to hold meetings next Tuesday night and Wednesday night in homes in Kansas City, and you can find the information at our website, thenarrowpath.com. If you're in Kansas City area and want to join us next Tuesday and or Wednesday night, go to thenarrowpath.com and look under announcements, and you'll see where those meetings are. The Narrow Path is listener-supported. You can go to our website also and find out how to donate if you want to. That's thenarrowpath.com. I'll be right back. Stay tuned for 30 seconds, and we'll have another half hour together. Small is the gate, and narrow is the path that leads to life. Welcome to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you, but everything to give you. When today's radio show is over, we invite you to study, learn, and enjoy by visiting thenarrowpath.com where you'll find free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all the Narrow Path radio shows. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Remember, thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we have um, more callers on the line. We do have a line open for you. If you have a question about the Bible or the Christian faith, you may reach me at this number in the next half hour. 844-484-5737. It looks like that line may have just filled up, so you want to keep the number handy. If you call in a few minutes, there may be a line opening up. The number is 844-484-5737. All right, our next caller is John from Salt Lake City, Utah. Hi, John. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Hey, thank you for taking my call. Uh, sure. Your name is Steve, right? It is. Okay. Uh, I want to follow up with the question as well, because I have a couple of questions, and I'll try to make them real quick. Okay. Uh, is this gospel preached in the literal 1,000-year reign of Christ? This same this... gospel, is it going to be preached in the millennial reign? Well, first of all, I'm not a premillennialist, so I'm not looking uh, for a, th- a literal thousand-year reign of Christ. Uh, but uh, those, but when I was a premillennialist, I did not think the gospel was going to be preached in the millennium because uh, Jesus was going to be here, and we were going to be, you know, the saved were going to be ruling with them, and the other people were not the saved, and uh, there was no no theories about whether there'd be evangelism during that time, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a premillennialist, so I don't I don't presuppose that there will be this thousand year reign. Okay, and the reason I ask that is because I believe in literal the literal reign, and a lot of other people do. Of course, but the, the the concern I have is I personally believe because I do believe in the literal reign of uh, Christ, uh, the thousand years. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verses mm-hmm. fifty one through fifty four. Yeah, uh, I believe can apply at the end of the millennial reign. Because if you believe in the millennial reign, you believe that there's people still in the grave at the end of the millennial reign. That's right. why that verse says those that are in the grave will be resurrected first. Those that are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air forever to be with them. The reason we meet them in the air, and it's not in there, but logically it looks this way, the earth will be destroyed, burned up, according to Peter. Mm-hmm. Peter says that it would be burned up at the end that's why i believe we meet in the middle of the air in the air because we can't be here when it's burned well but i, I also so too. believe that first Corinthians 15 51 54 can be applied at the end of the millennial reign if you believed it was literal well uh that would mean that there are two resurrections that involve christians uh there'd be the resurrection that happens when jesus returns and raptures the church 
and then there'll be another resurrection a thousand years later at the end of the millennium. Uh, the Bible doesn't really ever make it clear that there are two re uh, resurrections. It's true that, that Revelation 20 talks about the first resurrection, but in the context that it gives it, I think it's talking about the first resurrection is rebirth. It's the spiritual resurrection that Christians have now, and the, the resurrection at the end of Revelation 20 is the physical resurrection at the second coming of Christ. But that's, of course, a different paradigm than, than what you're presupposing, so we, we're just going to probably have to hold different views about that. Okay, one more thing, and, and I think you and I can touch on this one here. I personally believe that in 1 Corinthians 15, 38, it talks about getting a body. Also in Corinthians, it's Paul's describing the terrestrial and the spiritual. I believe when we get our body after death, immediately after death, we get our immortal body. Uh, my question is, what is God coming back to get at the... It, it, who's getting resurrected when he comes back? Because it says that the saints are coming back with him, angels are coming back with him. So who is being resurrected when he comes back with the saints and the angels? Yeah. Well, my understanding is a little different. I don't believe that we get a body as soon as we die. I think that we go be with the Lord, but, but we're absent from the body, Paul said. Uh, we're present with the Lord, but we're absent from the body. And I, I, don't, I suggest that that would mean we don't have a body, but we will get our bodies r resurrected and glorified at the resurrection later on. So when we come with Christ... Uh, we will have been with him spiritually from the time of our death until the time that he returns to earth and we'll come with him back to earth and our bodies will be raised and we'll be in them. That's that's the way I think most Christians have understood that throughout most of history, though I have met people that hold the view that we get some kind of a body in heaven. I, I'm not persuaded that that's stated in Scripture. Even the reference okay. to terrestrial, he talks about terrestrial bodies and celestial bodies, Terrestrial means earthly, and celestial means Correct. heavenly. But he's actually talking about <clears throat> celestial bodies being, he kind of equates the celestial bodies with uh, the sun and the moon and the stars in the next verse. He's the bodies up of the, the light-bearing bodies up in heaven and so forth. I don't think he's talking about our bodies that way. Well, okay, and, and the reason I say we get a body, because I'm going to give you a few examples. When Jesus was resurrected, the saints of old, came out of the graves. Job speaks about walking this earth, seeing his Savior while in this body. He says, after this body is decayed, I'm, he's going to walk the earth, he says. Also, why is it that Jesus has a body, Moses has a body, Elijah has a body, the saints of old has a body, the um, ones that die in the tribulation that were under the altar were given white robes. And we know that a white robe cannot fit on a spirit. Remember, Jesus said, uh, uh, the scriptures state, you can't see the spirit, you can't see the wind, but you see the effects of it. So if you say there's only a spirit, who sees you? Because Okay, it's well, let me ask you this. This apparently, okay, matters. this apparently matters to you more than it matters to me. I, I don't really see what, ma what it matters to me if I have a body while well, I'm in I heaven or not. I don't believe in pre-trib rapture. I don't either. But, oh, you, I thought you believed in the rapture that when he comes back the second time. Right, not the pre-trip rapture. That he's coming back to get the bodies that are in the grave. Is that true? Right, that's correct, yeah. But if, see, and that's why I say I don't believe that, because according to Scripture, we already have a body. Like I just described well, the people that okay, came out but, of the grave. Well, I don't, I don't think the points you made are that persuasive. Uh, I, all the verses mm -hmm. you used I'm familiar with, and I have no, I see no compulsion to understand them in the way that you are, but I don't also feel any compulsion to convince you otherwise, because I can't imagine what in the world difference it would make in my life if I saw things your way or my way. So I, I personally no, don't just, see those verses your way. No, I, I'm, I'm just saying that I, I, I'm not, I'm just, we're just talking here, but I, what I'm trying to say is that I see them differently because I'm looking at people that have already been resurrected and they have a body. My, my thing is, is why do they get a body? But me, a well, Christian, just like okay. him, I don't get nobody, a body until he comes back. Okay, huh? nobody, nobody except Jesus has received a glorified body yet. And the reason I know that is because of the same chapter you're talking about. He says 
in uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians 21, for since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead, for all as in Adam, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are his at his coming. Okay, so Christ is the firstfruits of the resurrection of the dead, and then the next in the order are those who are his at his coming, which is still future. So between Jesus and our resurrection, I don't think anyone has experienced the glorification of the body and resurrection that Jesus did. Now, some people who died came back to life. For example, Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead even before Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, and he raised Jairus' daughter and another young man who lived in the city of Nain, the son of a widow. Now, Jesus and even Elijah and Elisha raised people from the dead, but none of them came back alive in their glorified bodies. Jesus is the first to do that. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead in that sense, the first fruits of the new creation. So the new creation is not just involving dead bodies coming alive. It has to do with dead bodies being glorified into a new kind of body. Now that hasn't happened to anybody except Jesus because Paul said it's all, it happens to everyone in proper order, Jesus first and next us when Jesus comes. So between Jesus' resurrection and ours, I don't think there have been any. Now, you mentioned saints of old come out of the graves. The Bible doesn't talk about saints of old coming out of the grave. In, in Matthew chapter 27, you're thinking of verse 51 and so forth, that it says that many uh, holy people came out of their graves when Jesus did. But we're not told that these were saints of old. These, as far as I know, were people who had died recently, just like Lazarus came out of his grave. He had died recently. And this doesn't mean that they came in glorified bodies. The book of Revelation, where the martyrs were given white robes to wear, is, to my mind, entirely symbolic. And I don't think that it's, I don't think we can derive that they had physical bodies from that. There are different, you know, ways that I would take the various verses you used. But uh, one thing we can say is that Paul does say in First Thessalonians 4, that when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first, which means they haven't risen previously. And then those who are alive remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. And even the passage you gave me in 1 Corinthians 15 says, we will not all sleep, as we won't all die, but we will all be changed. And so the trumpet will sound, he said, and the dead will rise and we shall be changed. So he's again talking about two classes of people when Jesus comes, the dead will rise, and then those who have not died, who are Christians, will also rise with them. And, and there's this, he says, this mortality will put on immortality. We're going to be changed into, into the likeness of Christ. That hasn't happened to anybody except Jesus so far, at least as I read the scriptures. But it's not worth keeping everybody waiting online uh, to, for us to discuss it further, but, but in my just, opinion. Just let, me, let, me, uh, let me clarify something, and I apologize. You're correct. But in Matthew 27, uh, it does say, And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave. Right. Exactly. I agree. I agree. It doesn't say anything about the saints of old. You said saints of old, no, like no. people from the Old Testament. Now, these were just saints, no, but, holy people. I, Listen, I'm sorry we can't argue all day because my lines are full, and I think you've had a chance to say what you want to say. And if you want to remain convinced of your view, I don't even have an interest in changing your mind. So it really makes no sense to keep everyone waiting for us to go further into this. Let's talk to Donnie from Michigan. Donnie, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, sir. How are you today? Good, thanks. Yes. I, I want a question that I've never been able to answer, and I've never found a person be able to answer. And did Adam and Eve go to heaven or hell? Well, the Bible doesn't say whether they went to heaven or hell. In fact, the Bible doesn't it say... It answered. Well, I think we could make a good guess, but the truth is that the Old Testament... We can characters... guess on things because that's... Let the Lord be true and every man alive. We can guess. Well, we don't okay. know. We don't oh, know. Okay, I'll tell you what. You don't have to guess. I make I make certain educated guesses. If you don't want to do so, somehow that may sound unsafe. Oh, I do, do that very often. It's a okay. requirement of Christ. What is a requirement of Christ? A requirement of Christ is to be able to judge things. If people tell me you can't judge, but as long as you don't judge of yourself and judge of the Spirit, it okay. will lead you. Okay. So, well, in my, in my opinion, the Old Testament saints who died in faith uh, are in heaven, just like New Testament saints who die are in heaven. But uh, whether Adam and Eve were saints 
and believers when they died, we are really not told. We know that they committed a sin, and they probably committed other sins too, just like we all do. But do we know whether they repented? I don't know, because the story doesn't continue in detail. We do read of them having more children. We do read of them living to be 130 years old and then dying, all of which was after they sinned. But we're not told exactly how they lived their lives after that. They, uh, we do know that when they sinned, God killed animals and covered Adam and Eve with the skins of those animals. Many people see that as an atoning sacrifice that God made for them to cover their sin. That may be a right way of looking at it, or it might not be. But uh, the real question is, how, how did they die? And we don't know how they died. They may have died as believers or not. So we don't really know for sure. And I would say it'd be awfully hard for someone who'd been through what Adam and Eve had and walked with God in the garden to not be believers uh, in the end. I mean, we don't know that they continued to live as rebels against God for the rest of their lives. We don't even know that of any particular sins they committed after the original sin that they committed. So we don't know, but I, I'm going to guess, but I don't have to know. I mean, if you don't want to guess, if you feel like it's unsafe to make guesses, then don't make any guesses. But I'm going to guess they may have repented and that the sacrifice God offered of animal skins to cover them is a hint so that God forgave them. Pardon? But can I ask you one question? What? Hello? Yes. What is your question? Hello. My question is this. I understand that we have lived in three dispensations, the pagan age, the Mosaic age, and the Christian age. No other age exists to me as a Christian, and I have to understand those things from the basis of who it was talked to, who it was given to, and, and what we have today. Jesus is my Okay, favorite. that doesn't sound you know, like you, you said you wanted to ask a question. That's not a question. What, what is your question? My question is this. My question is this. Is there three dispensations? Um, there uh, could be. It depends, it, depends, it depends on how you define a dispensation. The Bible doesn't use that term. Uh, people who call themselves dispensationalists usually believe there are seven dispensations. I'm, I'm, you know, I guess you could divide history into seven segments and do that if you want to. But it depends on what the significance is that they're saying. You see, dispensationalists often say there are seven different dispensations and there are seven different covenants and seven different means of salvation throughout history. I wouldn't agree with that. And even if there's three dispensations, uh, I, I don't know what that's seeking to imply. We certainly can describe history in terms of certain turning points and the points between the, the space between those turning points. We could call them dispensations if we want to, but what's the significance of doing so? If you're suggesting that there are uh, maybe different means of salvation in different dispensations, I'd have to disagree with that. And I would say so because the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 goes through the entire history of the Old Testament, starting with Abel, and goes all the way through the Old Testament history and talks about those who were justified by faith or they, they received a good report from God by faith and basically saying that that's the same for us. So salvation has always been by faith, no matter what dispensation a person might be said to be living in. As far as describing different dispensations, I, I don't know how many we want to describe. There's certainly, as I say, the space between any turn, any two turning points could be called a dispensation, though the Bible doesn't use that term. That's the way it is used by dispensationalists. And I can think of, you know, lots of different turning points in history, and we could, we could call the space between them as dispensations. But the, since the Bible doesn't, I'm not sure it would be worthwhile or significant or... And then Eve then became the Mosaic Age, and then it became the Christian Age, but those are the ages that we... But it, before then, it was pagan. I okay, mean, darling. you know, idols and everything, but he, he gave us commandments through Moses, okay. through Okay, hey, Donnie, hey, Donnie, Donnie, Donnie. Uh, I've got people waiting to ask me questions, and you're not one of them. You're not asking any questions. I appreciate your call. Uh, see me from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I'll ask a question, and then I'll take the answer off Eric because my okay. phone's in the car with me. He wants to All hear right. it, too. But uh, in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 1, it says that God on the sixth day created man, and he created male and female. And then in the next chapter, it talks about Adam and Eve. So yeah. my question is, could it be possible that there are created men and women who did not fall from grace, and they are in their perfected stage. And the 
Bible only takes up Adam and Eve because it is pertinent to us. And I'll take the answer off the air. Okay. I appreciate your call. Uh, there are two creation accounts. One is in Genesis 1 and the other is in Genesis 2. And there are differences in what they say. And some people think that they were two different creations. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, it does say that God said, let us make man in our own image, and he made them male and female, and, uh, and told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, then in chapter 2, it starts kind of, looks like it starts over, before there's man on the earth, and he makes Adam from the dust of the ground, and then Eve separately. Now, almost all Bible scholars I'm aware of believe, which, as I do, that these are two accounts of the same creation that the second chapter is simply giving a focus on one aspect of it, that chapter one runs quickly through six days but and doesn't give uh, you know very much detail about any of them, but that the last day, the creation of man and woman, is so important that a separate chapter is given to unpacking it in more detail. So I think that the creation of Adam and of Eve in chapter two is simply restating something that was said more briefly in the first chapter, that God made male and female. Now, there is that view that some have taken that chapter one describes a pre-Adamic human creation. Um, and then Adam and Eve were you know, created separately. But chapter two tells us that before God formed Adam from the dust of the earth in chapter two, verse seven, it says before that in verse five, there was no man. God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. So when Adam was created, there were no other humans around. And also in chapter three, after they fell in Genesis three twenty, it says Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So before Adam was created, it says there was no man. And, and it says of Eve, Adam's wife, she was the mother of all living. This would not be true if there were certain other human beings on the planet that were not related to Adam and Eve or not descended from them. So I think that while I'm unfamiliar with that particular theory, I, I don't think it fits the, uh, the facts of Scripture. I hope that helps. Alicia from Oceanside, California, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi. Um, I'd like you to unpack uh, St. Mark 16, 18. Okay. Well, that part of Mark is not found in the oldest manuscripts. It's found in a lot of manuscripts of Mark, but it's not found in all of them. And the oldest ones don't have it. And therefore, some people feel that that portion of Mark doesn't really, it's not really part of the original. I disagree. I, I, I do accept it as authentic. But the section we're talking about is Mark 16, verse 9 through 20. Those uh, 12 verses are questioned. In fact, in the manuscripts we have of Mark, there's several different endings of Mark. The oldest manuscripts end the book at chapter 16, verse 8. And what we have in our Bibles, verses 9 through 20, is called the long ending of Mark. There's also a shorter ending of Mark that's, that's longer than verse 8, but, but shorter than verse 20. So there's some question about the authenticity of these verses. But I'll tell you, uh, the reason I accept them is because even though our oldest Greek manuscripts do not have verses 9 through 20 of Mark 16, these verses do appear in certain writings that are older than our oldest Greek manuscripts. For example, Irenaeus, who wrote in 170 AD, uh, he seems to have quoted from this section. So the Bible he had contained it, even though our oldest manuscripts in Greek don't. But our oldest manuscripts in Greek are probably 150 or more years after Irenaeus' time. So there's reason to accept them, though many scholars dispute them. Now, you're asking specifically about verse 18, which says right, they will take, they will take up serpents. Person. Yeah. Yeah. It's, of course, a completion of verse 17. It's one sentence. He says, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not by any means hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, this is right after he says to preach the gospel to every creature. And those who believe will be saved. Those who uh, do not believe will be condemned. And then there will be these signs that follow those who believe. Now, some people think that these signs are somehow normative behavior for every Christian, that everybody is supposed to lay hands on the sick and the recover. Everyone's supposed to cast out demons. Everybody's supposed to take up serpents. Everyone's supposed to drink poison and so forth. 
But I think what's being said here is that where the gospel goes and is preached, there will be signs following. And of course, the very last verse of Mark actually says that this happened, says they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. So there's going to be signs that follow uh, that are going to accompany the preaching of the gospel. It's not saying that every Christian will do all these things, but things like this will be happening where there are believers. Now, as far as taking up serpents is concerned, it doesn't mean that they'll deliberately pick up snakes, but sometimes people get bitten by snakes accidentally, and, and what's being suggested here is just like if they drink poison and are immune to it, uh, so they'd be immune to snake bites. And, and this actually happened, of course. One, one instance is given in Acts chapter 28 of Paul when he was on an island gathering sticks for a fire that a snake bit him on the hand of viper, and he shook it off into the fire, but he didn't die, even though it was a deadly snake. So that was a sign. It was a sign to the people who saw it, and they, you know, they became believers because they saw it. This is, I think, what's being said, is that when the gospel is preached around the world to every creature, uh, there will be signs accompanying it when those who believe would refer to the Christian church. And in the Christian church, there would be various ways in which God would manifest and confirm his word through supernatural signs, including things like Paul being bit by a snake and not getting hurt by it, uh, and including probably drinking deadly things. Now, this is not something that Christians would do on purpose, of course. Um, and in many cases, it, it may be re simply referring to bad water. You know, when you travel around in the third world, sometimes the water is death deadly. Uh, and, and yet basically saying, well, it's not going to hurt them uh, to see somebody able to drink something that would hurt other people and that person's not hurt by it would be one of the kinds of signs that, that would follow. We don't know of any examples of that particular one, but there's no reason to doubt that that happened, just like, just like a man surviving a venomous snake bite. So surviving the drinking of un, unwholesome water or something deadly like that could well have happened. We don't know of instances. So as far as, like, um, churches that believe they should uh, take up serpents or things like that. Uh, how does that? How does that go? It goes badly a lot of times. You know, sometimes they take up serpents, they get bit, and sometimes they die. Uh, that would be called tempting God. You know, the Bible. The Bible says. You know, he's given his angels charge of you to keep you in all your ways, and in their hands they'll bear, bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. But when the devil tried to get Jesus to jump off the temple and quoted that verse to him, Jesus said, that's tempting God. Uh, there are promises of protection uh, in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that God intends for us to put ourselves unintentionally or unnecessarily in harm's way on purpose. Uh, if God has you out doing some work for him and a snake bites you, it may be that God would have you uh, be immune to it so that you could continue your work. But if you're sitting safe and sound in church and they bring in a bag of rattlesnakes and you start handling them, that's not anything God's calling you to do. And you're just tempting God. You're, God does not necessarily work miracles on demand. Uh, he, he doesn't do a command performance whenever a Christian wants it. Uh, basically what he's saying is there will be, in fact, supernatural things that accompany the preaching of the gospel, including some of these. But I don't believe he's saying that Christians are supposed to go looking for trouble and drinking poison on purpose or handling deadly snakes on purpose. Uh, there's no, no reasonable way to make these verses suggest that. I think people who do it have often found that deadly snakes sometimes do kill Christians. It can happen. You're listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are on Monday through Friday doing this very same thing for an hour each afternoon. We are listener-supported. We pay for the time on the radio. If you'd like to help us pay for that time so we can stay on the air, you can write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or you can donate online if you want. Go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and see how that's done. Let's talk again tomorrow. God bless you.